Hi everyone, welcome to this event, which is being put on in collaboration between Strathmore University and Democracy in Africa. As you will know, misinformation, disinformation, fake news are all terms we've heard regularly throughout the Kenyan election campaign 2022. From the Mozilla report on ethnic hate speech and stereotyping uh, taking place on TikTok, to concerns about the use of Facebook and onto the way that Twitter was used, both during the campaign and indeed in terms of debates about the results after the election day itself, we've seen a constant worry about the significance of misinformation. Yet, on the other hand, in the end, this was a largely peaceful election. Kenyans voted as usually in peaceful and orderly ways, and the election was ultimately verified by the Supreme Court. So that raises, I think, a couple of really interesting questions. The first is, what was the nature of misinformation, disinformation in this election? But also, two, whatever that was, did that actually have an impact on the election outcome? What are the significant implications moving forwards? And perhaps finally, then, what is the long-term legacy of the process we've seen in 2022 for the next polls? To discuss that today, we are very lucky. We have a fantastic panel. Uh, which I'm delighted about. Uh, first up, we're going to have Justin Willis. Second up, we're going to have Mohamed Garib. And finally, we're going to have Gabrielle Lynch. Uh, all of those people are going to be speaking on projects that involve more than themselves. So rather than me spending a long time explaining that now, I'm going to leave it to each speaker to introduce their team and introduce their project at the beginning of their time. I'm going to ask our speakers to stick to 15 minutes. I'll give you a little bit of leeway. But like the Supreme Court, I'm accepting no hot air today. So if you go too much over, I will intervene. And the reason for that is I want to make sure that we have some time for discussion. I see some great people uh, in the audience already, such as Jackie McGrade and others who might want to uh, come in and offer some discussion thoughts. Uh, I will offer some of mine myself. But we also, of course, want to make sure we have time for Q&A. As they were using the webinar function of Zoom, please note that that will be done using the Q&A button. So bottom right hand screen, corner of your screen, you should see uh, the Q&A function. Please click on that and then enter your questions there. Those questions will be visible to all the panelists and then we'll pick those up and respond to them later. So thanks everyone for joining us. Just a final reminder that we are recording this. And Justin, over to you to kick us off. Thanks very much, Nick. I'm going to share screen, if I may. Uh, and I hope this is going to work. Okay, good. So uh, the project that we undertook uh, identified two key questions around social media to be addressed through some qualitative research and through some survey work. Uh, my colleague, Gabrielle Lynch, will talk a little more about the survey work. I'm gonna talk mostly now about the qualitative work that we did. We had two questions. How will candidates and activists make use of the potential array of digital platforms for communication and mobilization? And what new practices are emerging among voters and civil society in terms of sharing information and indeed misinformation and holding institutions and politicians accountable? Previous work has pointed in two different directions. Some studies, broadly optimistic in tone, have emphasized the role of social media in creating a more informed public debate and increasing accountability. Others have seen social media as a dangerous accelerator of misinformation and hate speech. The qualities of work took two different approaches to investigating this, looking both at the output through a selective reading of Twitter accounts and Facebook pages, which was undertaken by myself, but also by a team of assistants um, sourced through Strathmore University, some of whom I believe are with us today, and we also undertook a small number of interviews and we undertook the survey of activists and social media users, which Gabriel will talk about in a little while. So the headline results were these. The first and perhaps kind of the biggest one is that social media are inescapable. Candidates really have to use digital platforms. It's not possible to escape this. Uh, as one interviewee put it to us right now, you cannot run away from social media. There were some dissenting voices. Another candidate told us that if you engage your energy on social media, it's a waste of bundles. But that was very much a minority voice. And it should be said that that candidate did not do very well in the election. No one else agreed. And much more widespread was the view that, as, as the candidate put it, you can't run away from it. 
and a sense, which was, I think, very striking, that not being on social media made candidates very vulnerable. It wasn't just that social media was a place to campaign. It was also that social media was a place where people felt exposed and vulnerable, and therefore they thought they had to be present to defend themselves. As one person put it, you have to be visible, otherwise people will hear rumours and believe those rumours. So that's the big headline. You can't get away from social media if you're a candidate now. There were some other headlines as well. Access to social media space is deeply unequal. Money is very much involved in social media work. Money could and did by profile. And incidentally, men tended to dominate social media so far as we could tell. Hate speech, the incitement of antagonism and violence towards particular groups, was not as common in the campaign as many people feared, although it clearly did occur. Candidates and activists were all aware of a public gaze and they feared official sanction, but they also feared public opinion and the possibility that hate speech might be turned against them by their rivals. Both of the alliances in the presidential race were seeking to mobilize support across Kenya, and they were very aware that particularistic message could backfire. Fourth, while it was not always easy to identify misinformation, and I should say that the, the lines between satire, rumors, hearsay, exaggeration, and outright falsification were often a little bit unclear, social media were awash with material that was factually inaccurate in one way or another. Despite some efforts by platforms and users to counter this, this probably became even more obvious after the, the votes had been cast in the post-election phase when there was even more misinformation circulating. That was partly because another finding that a significant proportion of people to whom we talked who were involved in social media work expressed a willingness to spread misinformation if they felt it would benefit their campaign. Their justification for doing this being that others were doing it and so therefore they had to do it as a way of responding to others. There seemed to have been very little moral limitation on the spreading of misinformation and some people clearly felt or justified their doing of it by saying that it was necessary and inevitable. The final point is that the term social media itself is one that we might perhaps to some degree question. We tend to privilege digital social digital platforms by calling these social media, but of course they exist in a much wider information landscape, which is in itself profoundly social. They interact with newspapers, with television, with radio, and with everyday conversations. Other media, which are also driven along by social engagement and which are also very much about social interaction. The use of digital media was always closely engaged with these other kinds of media, and all of them are social. So we might take away a little question mark around whether we should privilege digital media as inherently social as against other forms of media. Beyond those platforms, there are some other points we can take away from the research. It's clear that people use platforms, digital platforms, in very different ways, seeing particular platforms as having particular kinds of role. For connecting with voters locally, Facebook was identified as the key platform by pretty much everyone to whom we talked. WhatsApp was seen as a term for mobilizing and for gathering views, both from supporters and through tapping in more or less covertly to the WhatsApp group of opponents. It seemed routine for campaigners who we encountered to be involved in many WhatsApp groups, 20 or 30 not being uncommon. Some groups seemed to be a bit random, but some activists were very systematic in their creation of WhatsApp groups for particular locations or groups. They thought about the demographic in, in creating these WhatsApp groups and used them, it seemed, quite effectively. Although WhatsApp is, of course, less public than Facebook by its nature, another interesting thing was that those using it were still aware of the possibility of scrutiny. They knew that people could find their way onto WhatsApp groups in multiple ways, and as was pointed out to us, it's in the end much easier to hide your identity on Facebook than it is to hide it on WhatsApp, given the link of WhatsApp to, to phone numbers, which are registered. Twitter was seen in quite a different way to Facebook and WhatsApp. 
it's a more expensive platform, as a number of people pointed out to us. It eats up bundles quite quickly. Almost everyone to whom we talked saw Twitter as a national platform, one favoured by social and political elites rather than ordinary people. A number of local level politicians did not use Twitter at all. Many more tweeted only occasionally, but used Twitter to follow national events and debates. So everyone thought they had to be on WhatsApp and on Facebook. Not everyone thought they had to be on Twitter. They thought that Twitter was for doing a different kind of stuff. It wasn't for doing local politics. There were contrasting ways of thinking about these distinct profiles. One activist who saw her role very much in terms of promoting national debate and influencing presented Twitter's elite nature as an advantage. Twitter was, as she put it, the people that actually matter. That was a way that you got through to people who could change things. For her, Facebook was irrelevant, as she put it rather disparagingly, the caliber of people on Facebook is low. Meanwhile, though, others whose concern was much more with local politics and with the mobilization of voters around very local issues thought that Twitter was irrelevant to their tasks. For them, Facebook and WhatsApp were what mattered. Facebook, as one put it, is where the voters are. For those who see social media as a leveling or democratizing force, the qualitative research was in some ways a little bit dispiriting. Money is a very big factor, as one interviewee put to it. The term blogger was widely used, really just to mean a person who is rewarded for posting content onto an online platform. It seemed that every candidate at every level was using bloggers. Even MCA candidates might have five or six bloggers on their team. MP and governor candidates had more elaborate teams with members of their entourage tasked with taking photos and videos and passing these on to a social media team for editing and working into messages for posting. And the level of professionalism varied very largely. Some bloggers were rewarded solely with data and the vague promise of future favors should the candidate win. Others were waged and were working pretty much full time to prepare material that was sometimes very professionally produced. So there was really a very significant degree, even at the same level. Some MPs had really quite sophisticated social media campaigns. Others seemed much more, how can I put it, unprofessional. But everyone was, in, was using bloggers. Everyone was paying people to blog. There was a degree of um, an almost adversarial aspect to this relationship between bloggers and politicians at some time. A number of candidates to whom we talked seemed almost resentful of the way that they had to use bloggers. They felt they needed to use bloggers. And as they put it, bloggers were earning a living from politicians. One said disparagingly, if you know how to write a word of English and you have a smartphone, then you become a blogger. <laughs> So this idea that blogging was a kind of temporary career upon which some people could launch themselves for the period of the election in order to earn a wage or at least earn data was a quite widespread one. Some people who are locally influential on social media were recruited specifically by local candidates to their team to, make, to take advantage of their influence. Others pushed their way onto teams by effectively by through a kind of use of protection money. By posting negative comments about candidates, they forced the candidates to seek them out and to offer them rewards to stop posting negative comments and to start saying nice things instead. As one candidate put it to us, um, you get negative comments, you find out who's coming from them, you talk to them and say, what problem do you have with me? And the person says, I don't really have a problem, it's just that I'm hungry. So this idea that social media could be used as a, a way to extort protection money from candidates was something that we encountered more than once. Campaign teams could be forced into buying off bloggers. Many candidates had Facebook uh, pages for their campaigns, unsurprisingly. Some also had Twitter accounts, as I've mentioned. Levels of professionalism varied. What was interesting was that much of the work of those hired to work on campaigns was not on these official accounts or pages at all. It took place instead in Facebook group pages or on other people's Twitter accounts, where bloggers were active in posting positive or negative comments in favor of their candidate or against others. 
So the focus of much of this social media work wasn't what you might call the official pages of candidates, it was actually other group pages outside. As one candidate put it to us, the official page is talking in a meaningful way, but the blogger's main focus is to talk dirt about the other candidate. And they talked that dirt very often on general Facebook groups or on Twitter pages. And Facebook groups that have kind of existences for other purposes, constituency or county notice boards or discussion groups got very much taken over during the course of the election campaign by this kind of positive and negative messaging by bloggers who are being paid by one candidate or another. That in itself created a further level of entrepreneurial opportunity. So it was not just bloggers themselves who could make money out of the election campaign. The administrators of existing Facebook groups or sometimes of WhatsApp groups could be brought off by politicians to ensure good coverage and to get access to those who followed the page or were members of the group. Some people started new groups, sometimes with the same name as existing groups, confusingly, to try and eclipse established ones. So by the end of the campaign, there were two Limuru notice boards run by rival administrators, each um, seeing themselves as linked to particular candidates. There were two accounts called uh, Homni Kilifi for Kilifi County as a result of this kind of, of administrators having been in effect brought off or compromised by their association with particular candidates. So entrepreneurs could create uh, groups or uh, on, on Facebook or WhatsApp groups in order again to take advantage of candidates' need for the publicity and for positive coverage. Group administrators then became political entrepreneurs. And as I said, you, we ended up with Facebook groups sometimes with the same name with different political leanings, a little bit confusing for the researcher who found themselves on the wrong version of the Facebook group at times. Ghost accounts were common and commonly used, especially on Facebook in particular. The use of pseudonyms in Twitter accounts was also very common. It's interesting that this use of ghost accounts sometimes could be used to disguise the decidedly gender skewed nature of social media. Men actually dominated the political use of social media. And it seemed that sometimes accounts in the name of women were often actually run by men. So as somebody said to us, some will be Irene, but he is not Irene, he is a man. So people were pretending to be women in order to post presumably because they thought there would be a political advantage to that. The use of such ghost accounts was often flagged to us as a problem and as linked to misinformation. Though it was also pointed out to us that in the tense and occasionally violent world of local politics, a ghost account might be the only way to post information about locally powerful figures. While the failure of social media platforms to police content is often lamented, it should be remembered there is often fierce scrutiny. In our small sample of interviews, we encountered two people who had actually been arrested for posting under their own names, critical comments about local politicians, which they insisted were accurate, but which nonetheless, the local politicians were able to secure their arrest as a punishment for having posted this information. That, according to at least some people, was a justification for the use of ghost accounts. Social media, as one put it, is dangerous for truth tellers. That's why you need to use ghost accounts. So there was a degree of protection against local revenge going on in the use of some of these ghost accounts. A lot of the material posted on digital platforms was actually really quite banal and the level of debate was very low. Much of the work of bloggers seems to have involved no more than posting emojis or very brief phases along the lines of WSR Tano Tena or Baba the Fifth. There was an amazing amount of content which really just boiled down to that. This was true of both uh, Facebook and of Twitter. A lot of the, the comment was just sort of kind of banal noise, basically. Some people suggested to us that WhatsApp made space for slightly more reasoned debate, especially in some groups. But it was also pointed out that the nature of the interface on WhatsApp meant that debates was very, debate was very easily disrupted when conversations took a new turn. A lot of the material on these digital platforms seemed to be shouting rather than discussing. However, having said that, not all of it was completely banal. 
Positive and negative comments tended to reflect campaign narratives. And in some ways you could see a degree of professionalism coming into the, the use of social media and obviously a degree of direction coming into the way that bloggers were being used to post material because they were being used to post in ways that echoed particular narratives that ca candidates wanted to encourage about themselves or about their opponents. So John Kiragu, who's standing as MP for Limuru, who had a big thing about kind of how he was going to get people to work, how he was the person who did work. The comments that come on his Facebook page constantly uh, replicate this idea of work. Negative comments similarly played on the negative narratives that people wanted to spread about their opponents. So this is uh, Rigati Kashagwa's Facebook page, where you see that the comments are echoing a particular narrative about corruption, which his opponents wish to spread about him. So there was a kind of sy systematic use to this comment. It wasn't all banal. Uh, and sometimes you could get both positive and negative comments coming up in the same thread, as in this, uh, these responses to a tweet by Abdul Samad Sharif Nasir, one of which bland and positive, the other, very much uh, working on the project narrative, which was being used against Abdul Samad. And sometimes social media use was sort of uh, almost creatively amusing, uh, with a little bit of work going into the construction of material, which was, again, pursuing particular narratives about particular characters, as in this case with a comment on Dennis Itumbi and his social media activities. Social media work was also seen by some as a way into a political career. A number of the people to whom we talked to were activists, saw themselves as future candidates and saw this as a way of building influence and building profile. They were doing this now for money, basically, but they were also doing it because they wanted in the future to be candidates. So all of this suggests that we should view social media neither with wide-eyed optimism nor with dread. It does not have an inherently leveling effect money and established power shape the possibilities for the use of these digital platforms. Half-truths and outright falsehoods circulate freely, and there's plenty of openly ethnicized messaging. But we should remember that misinformation also circulates through other media, through radio, through print, through word of mouth. And contrary to the fears of many, social media did not provide a forum for widespread incitement of violence or overt hate speech. Social media, digital platforms have become part of Kenya's electoral politics, but they have not fundamentally changed the nature of that politics. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Justin. That was great. Um, and lots of issues you raised. Two I'll just flag very quickly for people to be thinking about as we go to Mohammed. One is the sort of crossover between satire and what some people think of as misinformation or disinformation. And I think we saw quite a lot in the campaign of kind of satire and people making jokes in ways that you could code as disinformation if you really wanted to, but were really more about poking fun. And then the second thing that you raised there, which I think is also really important about, you know, what, what's the status of misinformation and disinformation on social media when you can't actually trust traditional media to tell you what's happening and the way in which that feeds into a broader environment. So really great food for thought. People, if you have questions for that really good presentation, please put them in the Q&A right now. We'll save them up until the end though, because right now we're going over to Mohammed. So Mohammed, 15 minutes for you. Please do introduce the project um, and your team. Um, and I'll come back in 15 minutes. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much uh, for attending the session today. Uh, my name is Mohamed Garib, uh, one of the research consultants working for Grodes Consulting. Um, part of I'm representing my team, uh, which is backed by uh, technology people. Uh, we have a number of other experts on data privacy and stuff, and uh, I am in charge of the research aspect of this project. So I'll be happy to take you through uh, what we <clears throat> what 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 we have uh, for you today. So <clears throat> partly is uh, defining uh, misinformation. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we picked up on misinformation during the election. And then the major part of our project was using artificial intelligence to be able to detect misinformation. So I will 
showcase a little bit of that. Uh, I'll talk about the data, sample misinformation. There were, of course, some challenges, uh, some mentioned by Justin just now, uh, and uh, some that I'll share. Then, of course, the recommendations. So <clears throat> one, one of the things that, uh, one of the misinformation uh, that sometimes circulates is that uh, the reason dinosaurs uh, don't exist is because uh, they, they probably missed Noah's Ark. Now, while this is meant to be a joke, uh, but uh, this is just one example of how uh, misinformation can be circulated. And uh, if there was a kid probably looking at this, uh, they might believe that this is true. Now, we've defined misinformation for the sake of this project uh, to mean that, uh, just a moment, to mean that uh, information that is false and has been intentionally used to manipulate people's opinions and belief. Uh, mark the word intentionally used to manipulate people's beliefs and opinions, because just like what Justin said, earlier, uh, there is the distinction between satire and humor sometimes that tends to come in. Uh, so while all that will be picked up as misinformation, but then it was important that we have a definition that will, use, will be used to guide this uh, study. One of the most popular misinformation shared during the election was that uh, uh, Pope Francis had endorsed Donald Trump even though the website uh, clearly said that uh, it's this, whatever they report is mainly just for fun. But then this article was circulated and shared amongst almost a million people in different medias. Now, uh, as you've seen uh, with this particular example, and actually the election of Donald Trump being a case study in many of the research that we've gone through, uh, this has also presented a number of challenges because of the rate at which misinformation spread, how far it can reach, and what implications it might have on the opinions of the people. Then came the question on how can we effectively use technology to detect misinformation. So then we came up with the idea of uh, AI, using an AI tool, uh, to, to be able to detect misinformation, mainly because there's actually an increasing volume of misinformation, and this has been increasing in every upcoming election, uh, and that's just in the election space. But as you've seen, there's misinformation spreading about COVID, about the COVID vaccine. It's an area that is constantly evolving with new technology, with uh, people joining social media, uh, the social media space becoming more and more active. So the speed at which information is shared, uh, it has increased. The volume of course has increased. Uh, and with uh, AI, we will be able to pick that up with higher accuracy. So because of the challenge of volume uh, and the speed, uh, we needed a technology that is going to be quite accurate in trying to uh, pick up misinformation. And I'll share a little bit more about the accuracy because I think that's it, it's, it's an important part of this research. This being a research, we picked up the Hugging Face library because then the AI model will give us access to various AI models that we can then test. We can train them the models, we can then test it out on a limited data set and be able to ascertain the performance. Now, some of these models have up to 80% accuracy when they were created or in the context at which they were created. Now, when you train it to use it in a different context, like the models we've picked up were trained on the US elections, However, because we've adopted them to be able to train them on Kenya data, uh, even after tagging the data, which one is misinformation and which one is not, training the model a couple of times, we were aiming for the model to be at least 80% accurate. However, we could not reach uh, 80% because 
uh, it was difficult to get trained tweets, uh, to get to, to train the model on a group of tweets that were well curated and a large number of tweets in this case, because then it would have uh, required more time to do. So how we do it is we pick uh, and filter tweets and then we run it through the model of our database and then we have the visualization dashboard. Now, why the choice of Twitter is because of the ease of access. It's not because of anything else, it's just the ease of access. Uh, aside from that, we felt that the, a lot of what goes on is actually shared faster on Twitter and Twitter being open, the fact that you can be able to see even people that you're not connected to uh, enabled us to do a lot more uh, to an extent where we were able to pick up tweets that were never retweeted by anyone, but then were shared and happened to be misinformation. So that open access is what made us uh, go to, towards the Twitter API. And of course, approvals to get the Twitter API were quite easy, unlike the Facebook model uh, and uh, uh, YouTube videos as well. It was a bit difficult. So this is a snapshot of uh, the misinformation dashboard. In fact, uh, it's filtering based on last week's data. As you can see, uh, the level of misinformation was quite low uh, last week, about 10-11%. Uh, it also tells us what is trending. Uh, and then we had categorized tweets into violence, gender violence, and hate speech. Uh, and then here, we are also able to look at how the tweet has propagated and the location data. Although there is quite a bit of improvement that is required on the location side, for the rest of the things we were able to drill down and go to the actual tweets without revealing the users, of course. So uh, the, the way the Twitter API works is they hold on to some data. So we are only able to see the tweet itself, but we can't see who tweeted it unless we cut and paste in Twitter to be able to uh, research on that. Now, on a week by week basis, we were tracking the average weekly percentage. What the figures you see uh, on your screen, 15, 17, 18, these are all percentages of misinformation uh, for the week. As you can see, there was a growing trend up to the 6th of August. So after the uh, August 9th election, uh, misinformation dropped a little bit and then the weekly average started rising uh, approximately up to when the Supreme Court uh, judgment was issued. And then after that, uh, it's now maintaining a weekly average of 10, 11%. Now, tracking misinformation over time, uh, we've, I've chose to showcase two, two weeks. One, the week of election, as you can see on Tuesday, because people were having election, uh, the misinformation was very low, 10%, and then it went up slightly, and then it maintained 16% uh, average uh, by Saturday. Then this is the week in which Supreme Court judgment was supposed to have come out uh, on 5th. However, uh, this is the week before. So, so the, the court proceedings were going on there was a high volume of tweets uh, being picked up by our filters and a high volume of misinformation as well. As you can see, it rose from lows of 1216 up to 2023 and was still on an upward trajectory ending the week at 22%. So basically the average weekly might be deceiving. When you do an average, it might look like it's not much, but then the daily numbers are a lot higher. And the volume as well, because it was a bit difficult for us to even get the gist of what the misinformation was about to be able uh, to, to have a daily report on what was going on today, what was the cause of such spikes. So while misinformation is triggered by events on the ground, uh, of course, in this case, it was about the election. Uh, we sampled some of what we picked up. There was misinformation being shared about IEBC commissioners being bribed, uh, Supreme Court being compromised, the Inspector General of Police being poisoned, uh, announcement of winners uh, before IEBC, uh, and this was happening in multiple counties. 
fear mongering and tribalism used to happen quite a lot and uh, throughout the election period, well before the election, during the campaigns, and much after the elections as well. Uh, there was a lot of uh, fear mongering and a lot of tribal comments. And then, uh, uh, as you know, the edited versions of Form 34 is at some point it was very difficult to be able to tell which one is the correct one and which one is an edited one on social media and which is the one that is on the IABC servers. And then there was allegations of uh, Uhuru refusing to hand over power uh, and that uh, he, he, he might have done something to the loss, uh, towards the loss of Azimio and stuff like that. So these are just some samples. Of course, we picked up a lot more. These are some of the challenges as again, uh, detecting misinformation. The server that we picked, the server that we picked was, uh, we, we had to pick a specific server which was running uh, GPUs, graphical processing units. Uh, because of these AI models require uh, quite a bit of resources. And uh, what we had to do, because the server was very resource hungry, we had to slow it down so that we can only look at data uh, like after the day's done. So we can not see data uh, one hour back. We can only see data roughly uh, uh, 12 hours, 24 hours back. Uh, and that, that was our way of trying to play around the resource uh, issue. Then model, models, of course, required retraining. Halfway through, uh, we picked up some issues, uh, which if there was a tweet bank that we could have bought uh, for the local uh, situation and be able to train the model, it could have worked quite well. Then the other thing which was very complicated is the use of languages. Swahili, mixture of Swahili, English, local languages, as you can see, there are tweets in uh, vernacular, there are tweets in uh, Kikuyu, there are tweets in Luo, uh, there were tweets, a mixture of Swahili and English, and it was becoming a problem. Unless you know what you're looking for, it was a problem for the, uh, for the engine to be able to pick this up. And then context, uh, you needed to learn uh, and to be able to know uh, the context in which the tweet was made. Uh, some words were deliberately misspelled. Uh, and uh, this also caused an issue because when you're trying to search for particular keywords, the uh, IEBC is sometimes IEBC, sometimes is uh, IBEC. Uh, and that's just an example of one, but uh, there's sometimes the arrangement of particular characters tends to be off and when you search for those keywords, you can't find them. Then changes in the keywords, uh, as you notice like there were hashtags going on. So there was a hashtag like Chebu Ruto, Kuzimia, Cherera. Uh, these were some popular hashtags uh, and I'm sure there were more that we picked up uh, during that study. But then again, these changes in misinformation flow uh, were constantly happening and it required a keen eye to be able to change filters if need be, uh, and to be able to be on top of the game in terms of identifying what is trending. So as far as uh, recommendations is concerned, I think the awareness and uh, sensitization should continue. This time there were a lot more people saying, this is fake, stop sharing, this is fake. Uh, this has been validated to be fake. Uh, and then uh, people would not actually pull down, but some had to pull down some tweets. Uh, I think you've seen cases where tweets were deleted. And then uh, uh, there's obviously more collaboration required because uh, the media council is doing something on this, the media themselves, the media houses, uh, the platforms, Twitter and Facebook are doing something regarding misinformation. Uh, as well as uh, the government is also trying to do something on misinformation. So basically what I'm saying is more collaboration is required between the groups so that we know who is doing what. And uh, organizations like Africa Check who have been very successful across Africa uh, to be able to decipher misinformation. When you report something, they do a fact checking and then be able to report. And they also are running on their own AI tool. And then 
uh, obviously the, there's need for further development of the AI tool. I mean, I wish we had a lot more technical resources to be able to continuously tweak the tool as we went on, because that would have allowed us to get uh, more accurate results uh, from what we are getting. Currently, what we have had to do is we get the results, but then I have to check through to make sure that they are actually misinformation. Then obviously the law that is guiding misinformation needs to be reviewed. Uh, and as you know, this has been an ongoing problem, not only in Kenya, but in other African countries as well. And then uh, be able to check on how misinformation progresses to pavement media. The word pavement media uh, might be strange to some people who are listening, but uh, this mainly means you've seen people around newspaper stands uh, and these people take information elsewhere and go and discuss it at the places of work and other establishment. So basically whatever is shared online then makes its way offline. So basically what I'm saying is there needs to be a study on how this progresses from online media to offline media. So I'll stop there and I think we will have a session for Q&A later on. So I thank you all very much. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Um, really interesting insights there. And I think some of the points you made about the dangers of averaging over weeks and so on and needing to look more carefully, the importance of needing to think carefully about spellings, right? And misspellings and deliberate misspellings all of those are really important and well taken. And I'm sure they've really helped to, to share a greater level of awareness amongst our audience. Audience, remember, we're looking for questions. We're gonna take them at the end, but please put them in now while your minds are fresh. Use the Q&A tab, which is in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And we will go to the Q&A at the end. Mohammed and Justin and others will take your, your questions. Now, finally, we're going to Gabrielle Lynch. Uh, many of you know Gabrielle's uh, written on Kenyan politics for a long time, but it's also interesting to know that she would be talking to us today about something which she's done in Kenya, but also done in some other countries. And so there's an opportunity perhaps in the Q&A to tease out some of those comparative angles as well. Gabrielle, over to you. Thanks, Nick. Um, I temporarily got cut off and I have lost my sharing rights. Uh, so could you allow me to share my screen again? Yes, I just did. So you should be fine now. Brilliant, thanks. Sorry, just having a slight issue with my computer. Great, just to confirm we can see that. Great. So um, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Um, this presentation draws from the same research project um, as Justin's, uh, but while Justin largely relied on our qualitative research um, and on our analysis of Facebook and Twitter accounts um, and interviews. I'll draw mainly on our quantitative research and more specifically on a survey that we conducted uh, in the final weeks of the campaigns via the Qualtrics phone app. Uh, so this app allowed us to set up a survey with links that we then sent to a targeted sample of candidates, uh, party officials and activists and social media communicators across the country who were actively involved in the campaigns. Uh, in total, 345 political actors completed the survey, 133 of them aligned to Kenya Kwanzaa and 184 to Azimio, um, and the other linked to smaller parties or independents. Uh, and this was actually a survey that together with Elena Gajanova, um, we did ahead of the elections in Ghana in 2020 and Zambia in 2021. Before I start, I turn to this survey data though, it's worth making two points that build on uh, Justin's earlier comments. Um, first, social media is increasingly a part of people's everyday lives. 
um, as we'll all know, a significant and increasing number of Kenyans access political news from the internet and social media through their mobile phone, with many accessing the internet every day and throughout the day. However, the impact of social media is even greater than rising mobile phone penetration and access rates uh, suggest, as Mohammed was just talking about. First, journalists and commentators source much of their information from and discuss social media content in their coverage. Uh, sometimes multiple people uh, some read messages or use the internet on a shared phone. And third, a significant proportion of people gain some of their news from conversations with family members, friends and other acquaintances, and other forms of pavement media, uh, such as sermons and street assemblies with many of those involved in pavement media and particularly more influential participants also active online. So social media is thus embedded in a much wider information ecosystem with news, including misinformation, often moving surprisingly quickly between on and offline spaces. This is important and has the somewhat paradox paradoxical effect of meaning, as Elena Gajanova, Gaddafi Saibu and I have argued in the Ghanaian context, that those who are offline are sometimes more susceptible to online misinformation than those who are online, since they tend to hear about such information through more trusted sources and have fewer opportunities to fact check. Second, Given the importance of social media, it's perhaps unsurprising that political parties and activities, activists uh, have invested heavily in this space. This investment usually involved, for all races down to the MCA level, a relatively small salaried communications team and sometimes a separate dedicated attack team who collaborated with a larger group of bloggers or influencers uh, who, as Justin was noting, worked in exchange for a small stipend and or a hope of a position or other form of assistance if the candidate in question was elected. However, as Justin noted, while social media was central to most people's campaigns, it hasn't changed the nature of them. Politics remains very ground intensive and politicians need to remain visible and to display their electoral viability, track record, and commitment to constituents to be competitive. An investment in social media thus constituted additional work uh, and expenditure that enabled candidates and parties to better organize their activities from the scheduling of rallies to the sharing of messages and propaganda to their efforts to trust strategize on and manage their campaign messages and propaganda through intra-party campaign or party groups and to conduct limited fundraising. The fact that social media was used for multiple purposes uh, was evidenced by our political actor survey. So responses revealed how a majority of those actively involved in the campaigns often use social media to connect with other party members, coordinate campaign events, reach out to loyal voters, persuade new voters, and defend their party from attacks while a majority also use social media often or sometimes to discuss campaign strategy and expose the failure of opponents. This multiple usage uh, ensured that while Facebook remains the most popular platform nationally, WhatsApp was the most frequently used by political actors. So while public platforms such as Facebook were widely, widely used to mobilize support, by, for example, sharing videos and photos of rallies, development activities and endorsements, and to de-campaign others, similar information was also shared by the multiple WhatsApp groups that many Kenyans are members of. At the same time, as a closed platform that allows for encrypted conversations, and in a context largely free of reports of spyware hacking of the platform, WhatsApp was also the preferred media for intra-party organization and discussion particularly at the local level. The level of intra-party organization, however, should not be overstated. Both parties and alliances failed to achieve the level of online organization witnessed in Ghana, for example, where intra-party WhatsApp groups run systematically from the national down to the ward level across the country. In contrast, many of those actively involved in the campaigns were members of overlapping national, regional, and local groups, 
which were often associated with an individual candidate rather than a particular party, and many interviewees reported little in the way of training and direction. Nevertheless, Kenya Kwanzaa appeared to be uh, slightly better organized than Azimio, with a clearer hierarchy in messaging and reportedly better pay for key bloggers. Um, given a tendency for people to underreport problematic activities in a survey, it's concerning that so many political actors said that it was completely or somewhat acceptable to share misinformation, especially when there was no harm to voters or penalty and or when it would help them to win. First, we have responses um, from those aligned to Kenya Kwanzaa, uh, and second, those aligned to Azimio, uh, with slightly higher levels of acceptability reported uh, by those aligned to Azimio. Similarly, it's concerning that a significant minority, 16%, uh, admitted to using or having used fake or dummy social media accounts, and that political actors thought uh, people in other parties were more likely than co-partisans to be involved uh, in such activity. Such suspicion is concerning, as we know from previous research on elections, that perceptions of wrongdoing by others is a key way in which personal wrongdoing can be justified. It's also clear that there was a lot of misinformation shared online during the campaigns, and that misinformation seems to have peaked, both in terms of volume and political significance, in the wake of the polls and during the presidential petitions at the Supreme Court, as Mohammed was just demonstrating. However, misinformation never reached the levels that many had feared, with the lack, for example, of good deep fake videos that could not be relatively easily debunked. Perhaps the closest uh, to such misinformation was the doctored uh, video of William Ruto reportedly attacking non kalenjin communities at a rally in early August 2022, which was immediately known to be fake by many and quickly reported as such by traditional media and also widely online. At the same time, and despite the increased use of social media in the campaigns, the majority of political actors uh, thought that the amount of hate speech circulating on social media was about the same or less than in 2017, while a clear majority thought that online gender abuse had declined. So what can explain this disjuncture between a willingness to break the rules if this would help a candidate or party to win and an increased use of social media, and on the other hand, the absence of an explosion of fake news and hate speech and a reported decrease in online gender abuse in the context of an extremely close and fiercely fought election. The answer links back to some of the points made by Justin earlier. Uh, so first, while social media allows for information to spread quickly and far, hate speech and fake news did not begin uh, with the rise of social media. Rumors and misleading news have always circulated. Uh, before this, the internet, this was done with text messages, before text messages via radio and word of mouth. Second, in interviews, a number of social media communicators spoke of how they were very keenly aware that they were being monitored by their opponents, various agencies, and the general public, and feared being held accountable or publicly embarrassed for offenses such as hate speech and fake news. Third, and most importantly, the fact that both alliances were seeking to support cross support, seeking to seeking support across different genders, ethnic, and religious groups, and that opponents were constantly on the lookout for material which, with which to decampaign them, acted as a deterrent uh, to disseminating information that could be relatively easily debunked or which could be presented by opponents as ethnically divisive and destabilizing, and thus as off-putting to a significant number of potential voters. Reinforcing these logics was the frequency with which misinformation was often debunked. The extent to which many uh, people were willing to call misinformation out online and the public criticism of those involved in sharing misinformation on such an activity was revealed, as occurred, for example, uh, with the key Azamiro leaders, including Jeanette Mohammed and Hassan Joho, who shared the fake video of Ruto mentioned above. 
that many people responded to fake news was also clear from our political actor survey with such activities uh, reported by these individuals. This is not to suggest that all misleading and divisive propaganda was discouraged. On the contrary, while many feared that misinformation that could be easily debunked might backfire in the context of cross-ethnic and religious campaigns, much information, um, as Justin already argued, is difficult to prove or disprove, with ge a general perception that politics is a dirty game, ensuring that allegations of nepotism and corruption, for example, often appear as highly plausible to a broad range of people. In turn, while explicit promises to co-ethnics and the demonization of ethnic others by candidates and party officials proved rare, claims that an opponent was nepotistic, corrupt, incompetent, morally bankrupt, a lapsed Muslim or Christian, or a failed wife or husband constituted a mainstay of the campaigns. At the same time, the fact that certain messages might be off-putting to many ordinary voters didn't mean that politicians always desisted from using them. Instead, it just meant that when they did, they usually made sure to distance themselves from such messaging by sharing the information through uh, real or fake accounts not directly associated uh, with the candidate or party uh, in question. There is thus, as Justin has argued, not a simple good or bad news story about social media use and the extent to which it plays a positive and or negative role in campaigns. Uh, this largely depends on context. In Kenya in 2022, there was clearly a lot of misinformation and some hate speech, and social media's place in a larger media ecosystem ensured that this misinformation often moved incredibly quickly between on and offline spaces. Political actors also uh, reported a willingness to share misinformation if it would help them in a tight race. But they and many ordinary citizens also called misinformation by opponents out. With information that could be easily debunked or be interpreted as hate speech, deemed as quite likely to backfire in campaigns that were so closely watched and in which candidates and their alliances were seeking to mobilize across ethnic, relig religious, gender, and other divides. Such logics help to explain the lack of an explosion of online misinformation, hate speech, and gender abuse, um, but also help to explain why misinformation uh, increased after those campaigns were over and as we moved into the post-election period. I will finish my comments there um, and hand back over to Nick. Fabulous. Thank you, Gabriella. Really interesting to see the findings of the survey presented. Right, everyone. Um, I'm going to say a few things as discuss some comments while we get the final Q&As. I see we've got four or five in, which is great. So uh, please do keep submitting there. I'll just say a few things and then we'll go to the panelists to respond to your questions. So as by way of a discussion, I think our, our three panelists have given great uh, talks, very clear, very eloquent, lots of interesting data. And it's great to see people actually bringing, you know, specific data um, and empirical research questions to this topic, which is often something which is discussed slightly in the absence of that level of rigor. And I think all three speakers have really given us a good understanding of the balanced way in which we need to be thinking um, about, you know, social media and misinformation and the way in which they can construct, you know, both positive and negative developments at one and the same time. And I think one of the things that's really interesting to me um, is that this really chimes from the evidence I've seen from other cases. So I'm going to draw right now on a piece on social media disruption, uh, which is called Social Media Disruption Nigeria's WhatsApp Politics, which was based on uh, the Nigerian elections um, and our understanding of how WhatsApp was used by the candidates in that election and the sorts of consequences it had. I just put that in the chat for people who are interested, but many of the points that have been made today, I think are echoed one way or another in that piece. So I think this isn't a Kenyan story. This is probably a much broader story. And again, probably not just an African story. There's probably to an extent a global story here about the way that things like Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp are playing out in, you know, let's say new democracies in which electoral rules Etc. fragile. And I just wanted to highlight a few things that I think come out of that broader, broader literature about when, you know, misinformation really matters. 
I think the sort of four conditions under which misinformation scales up and becomes something which is a bigger problem than just, you know, generating a few people here and there who are a bit, mis, you know, misconfused or a bit misunderstanding what's happening. Uh, in other words, when misinformation either leads to political violence or it leads to significant problems for the long term future of the country. One, we highlight in that paper, you know, this happens when you know, particular messages are used that play to existing assumptions and beliefs. In other words, misinformation is much more likely to become viral when it taps into popular suspicions about an individual, about a process uh, that, for example, um, you know, mean that it's sort of seen to be very plausible. In the Kenyan context, I think, for example, the misinformation and the belief in the misinformation that was circulated about the election results was believed by many people, particularly, of course, people who were on the losing side, because Kenya's had a series of controversial elections in which digital technology and so on has not always worked as intended. And so misinformation along those lines was playing into a set of pre-existing public expectations. Second, misinformation is particularly problematic when it's sustained through and with traditional media. There are two important conditions here. One is that traditional media is seen to be distrusted and therefore people are more willing to listen to what's on social media rather than see the traditional media as the official source of information. And two, when traditional media fails to challenge disinformation and misinformation. And here again, I think we can see this very clearly in Kenya in the final part of the process where most of the mainstream newspapers were fairly supportive of Raila Odinga and therefore were not particularly critical of misinformation around the election results. And therefore you saw traditional media taking a position that very much did not check the kind of misinformation that was flowing on social media platforms. Third, of course, misinformation is particularly likely to be sustained and powerful when it is directly and explicitly targeted by political leaders. And whereas, as Justin and Gabriella you know, explained during the campaign, we did not see high profile political leaders making statements that were you know, ethnic hate speech or making statements that explicitly evoked misinformation that often because they were aware, as Justin put it, of the public gaze. We did see that around the election results where senior political figures actually repeated things that we knew were actually not true and therefore gave them a second life by investing in them and giving them that kind of political legitimacy. And finally, fourth, we know that these sorts of messages are often most likely to be believed when they are, as it were, verified, quote unquote, uh, by trusted interlocutors. For example, civil society figures who are seen to have been historically neutral. And of course, in this particular context, we had both Martha Karua, but also figures such as John Githongo, lending their support to some of the accusations of electoral manipulation, which then created perhaps the perception for some that these were more credible because they had these figures who are known to be more independent minded, more in favour of good governance and democracy in the past. And again, that contributed to the extent to which they spread. And so I wonder in some ways whether the most significant consequence of this election is not the kind of ethnic stereotyping that Mozilla and others worried about on things like TikTok, but is actually the extent to which some of that misinformation about the electoral process and the results process was believed by some of those on the losing side, undermining the legitimacy of the new government, undermining the credibility of the IABC, storing up problems for future elections about the extent to which citizens believe that the electoral process was credible and operated as it was supposed to. Now, we've got lots of questions, so I'm going to go into them. We'll do a first round of questions and I'll give the panelists an opportunity to come back in the order in which they spoke. Um, and then we'll take a second round of questions if we get there. So Victor asks, and this is one I think for all of the panel, do you think 2027 will be worse for misinformation or is a victory of it feasible? So that's from Victor, is 2027 gonna be worse? Nicholas says, thanks Justin for covering the prominence of bloggers. Given that we saw a number of egregious social media misinformation spread as elected as MCAs or MPs this time round, what actions can we consider to stem the incentive to join in with this kind of behavior slash career path? So again, there Nicholas focusing on the intersection between misinformation and, and political figures. Ariambo uh, Okoyo, so Ariambo Yuko, my apologies. What are the factors uh, influencing trust or distrust of social media content in Kenya? Is it possible to gauge 
what are the parameters that average social media users here use to adjudicate content. And he's from the Forum for Civic Participation in Governance, Maguri County. Lovely to have you with us today, Odiambo. Uh, Bernard asks, my question to the first presenter, that was you, Justin, what was the a benchmark in terms of true information used to inform the falsity or other ways of information? In your opinion, what other metric could be used? I think that's a great question. That comes from Malaka from Strathmore University. Great question. How do you know what's true and what's false in a context which is so contested? And Victor, at the end, uh, how unique were these challenges to Kenya? Uh, and is it a continent-wide issue? That's perhaps something that Gabrielle, having done this work in, I think, Ghana and Zambia, might want to say a little bit too as well. Great, really good set of questions. So thank you very much, everybody. We'll start with Justin, go to Mohammed, then in with Gabrielle. If any of their statements brings up another question for you, please do feel free uh, to pop it in the Q&A and I'll put it to them in the second round. Justin, over to you. Okay, sure, I'll try to be quick. Uh, Victor, um, I think 2027 probably will see more of, uh, of information which is, um, well, we can call it misinformation for now, although I'll come back to that in a moment, but I think there will be more of it. Nicholas, it's a good question, but I don't think there's any kind of straightforward way of, of stopping this. And I, I think there are significant incentives for everyone to continue this career path, and there will continue to be incentives. Um, in terms of the role of bloggers in this, the only thing that would really stop people becoming bloggers and kind of enroll engaging in this career is if there was some other useful thing for them to be doing with their time and money. Much of this is driven by the fact that there are able and intelligent young people out there, perhaps who um, are finding it difficult to make a living in other ways. So they're turning to blogging to do this. And I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. Um, or the Ambo is, that's a, a, a great question. We do have some kind of survey material on people's attitudes to different sources of information. One of the interesting things is most people don't particularly believe in what, what they read on Facebook. There's, there's fairly high levels of skepticism. And I think people are inclined to cross check and verify. And we do have some survey material as well on, on how people decide what is false and what is true, which um, Gabrielle may be able to speak more um, clearly on that to that than I can. Uh, Bernard, I, I don't have a kind of clear measure of what is misinformation and what is not. And in, one of the great problems here, I think, is that it's very difficult to distinguish between what is what is just satire, what's intended, what is the passing on of rumour, what is deliberately intended to misinform. There are cases where you can, I think, pretty clearly see that stuff is being done deliberately to misinform. The editing of videos, the dubbing in of soundtracks, you know, that doesn't happen by accident. Um, nor does the, the the faking of Form 34As. So that there is stuff that kind of clearly looks like, okay, people are doing this deliberately to misinform. But there's a lot of, of material out there which, which, as you say, depending on your partisan affiliation, you might think is perfectly reasonable or is a perfectly reasonable interpretation of events. So I don't think there is a clear benchmark on this. Um, and in terms of the, the how, how unique are these challenges to Kenya, I'm not very well qualified to answer that, but my belief is that they are not particularly unique to Kenya and that this happens more widely elsewhere. But there are more knowledgeable people than me in the room who will speak more to that, I have no doubt. Thanks so much, Justin. Mohammed, over to you. Thank you. Uh, so maybe just to make a quick comment is that uh, the, the issue of misinformation is a complex one. And as you know, there are no easy solutions to complex problems because uh, as Justin mentioned, the having, uh, being able to tell what is the difference between satire and uh, real intended misinformation uh, is something that is uh, very difficult to do. Uh, and then the way misinformation spreads as well, uh, there's uh, elements like uh, the availability or issues like, <clears throat> what do you call it, uh, the echo chambers. So the echo chambers uh, also tend to sort of uh, constrict uh, misinformation to spread within uh, particular uh, lines. Uh, and these might be people you're connected to, these might be people uh, that are buying into what what you've just said and things like that, which make it even more complicated because you notice that the first person might have shared it, but not exactly shared it to cause any harm. Uh, 
Uh, and then the people that follow after that are actually responding to the tweet uh, and they an, end up causing a lot more harm than the first person who shared it. So uh, again, it's it's not very easy to, to decipher where, uh, where it stops and be able to tell that this is truly misinformation and this is not. However, uh, what we've seen with the AI is that it picks up everything that looks like misinformation and then it's up to us to tell what is misinformation and what is not. Uh, based on what Victor is asking, do you think 2027 will be even worse with misinformation? Well, uh, like what we've seen this time is that more people are aware. So uh, situation in 2027 is subjective to change. Uh, if people are more aware of this, then there will be less misinformation spreading, not creation, just the spreading. And then uh, if people are not aware, then of course the situation will be worse. But then, like I said, it's actually triggered by a, a number of events. And these events, like where we've seen a spike in our data is because something happened and then there was a spike. Like for instance, I'll give you a good example. When uh, the uh, maize flour price changed uh, from two, 230 to 100 shillings, uh, there was a, a spike in uh, high volumes of uh, tweets on that particular day and equally high number of volumes of misinformation on that day. So uh, it's actually dependent on the events at that particular time. So I think I've answered uh, most of what pertains to my study. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mohammed. Great, on to you, Gabrielle. Thanks. Um, so in terms of the, the trust question, um, from the survey data that we've got, it's clear that people are generally quite skeptical um, about information on social media and there's quite high levels of awareness of the amount of misinformation that is out there. Um, there's still a lot more confidence in traditional media um, and other key actors such as religious leaders, um, traditional leaders, etc. Um, this feeds into an important point, which is that the trust um, in social media posts differs depending on the person who posted or shared it. Um, so from our more qualitative research, uh, it's clear that people are more likely to trust information that is shared you know, by traditional media, you know, if it's, uh, uh, you know, on Facebook, but it's you know something a local radio station or something that will carry more weight. Similarly, if it's a trusted local religious leader um, or one of your friends or family members, um, and I know this from my own experience. <laughs> sometimes, I've been a little probably less quick to question things when it's been shared by you know, a fellow academic who I have great trust uh, in them. Only to kind of realise later on that actually um, I should have done a bit more investigation. Um, it's also clear from our survey in Ghana, um, and I think it's also true in, in Kenya, that people, so we did a nationally representative survey in Ghana where we found at the head of the 2020 election there, and we found that people who were not regularly online or who had no access to social media were less skeptical of social media and there being misinformation in that space than those who were regularly online. Um, and we found in conjunction with this that actually people who were regularly online and who tended to be more skeptical uh, and who also had better ability to you know, follow links, fact check, go and see if something was also reported by a uh, major media house, were, were better placed to uh, question misinformation online than those who are offline but heard about misinformation online through pavement media, for example, or through some vernacular radio stations uh, who sometimes shared information a bit too quickly without fact checking it. Um, in terms of continent wide, yeah, I think many of these things uh, are common across, I mean, clearly. Social media use is increasing across the continent. People are accessing this in very similar ways, largely through their phones, um, quite similar in terms of the platforms that people are using, 
the kind of investment that can candidates and parties are making. But there's also important differences. So, for example, somewhere like Ghana, where you have much stronger political parties and where those parties have clear structures across the country, uh, this uh, aspect of the campaigns that we were talking about where uh, there's some kind of controlling of the social media space because people want to ensure that their message uh, is appealing to people across the country and across divides. That was even stronger in Ghana. Um, and there was a lot more evidence in Ghana of people being held accountable by other people within the party uh, for sharing information that if it was found out to be false would make the party look bad. Um, so we have quite a few examples, much, many more examples in Ghana of people being thrown out of uh, WhatsApp groups, of being called up by people higher up in the party, telling them to stop sharing the kind of information that we're sharing um, than we found in, in Kenya. Zambia, it was just a very different space in 2021. Uh, COVID was much you know, kind of more in the pandemic in 2021. It was also politicized. Uh, by the government at, at the time and used uh, as a way to ban uh, kind of the, the classic rallies. So it's much more difficult to campaign offline in Zambia in 2021. And so online campaigning uh, became even more important. And it also became more important as a means uh, to organize different kinds of offline campaigning, such as as door to door efforts. So will 2027 be worse? I mean, it really depends on the context. I think, you know, if we see a situation where, again, people are campaigning across ethnic divides, if we see a situation where some of the parties have become stronger, then it might not explode uh, in the way that that people fear. Uh, similarly, if you see a kind of growing increase in digital literacy and a, a skepticism around information online and an ability to question that, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's less information or that it's shared less widely. I actually found that you know, information that people knew was fake was often something they wanted to share to say, look at, at this terrible information, it's fake. Um, so they were sharing it, but calling it out. Um, so it just means that it, you know, when you have higher levels of digital literacy, that information might have less of an impact. Pacini. Great, thank you very much. So anyone got a final question, do put it in the Q&A now. Um, just in terms of um, the final question, there's a great question here, which I'll put to all of you, and you can say that with your final remarks. Um, and Justin has said that maybe we could invite a couple of the research assistants on his project to speak. So if you would like to, that would be great. I will turn you uh, into panelists right now. So you have that opportunity should you wish to take it up. So I'm just putting you into panelist mode. Um, so yes, everybody, uh, please do feel free, put in your final questions. I'll just keep talking for a few seconds to give you an opportunity to do that. So the question that Patrick puts to us, and I think this is a great one to end on for everyone is, uh, as social media use continues to expand, do you think that the mainstream media is going to lose its influence on electoral politics? I think that's a really good question to wrap up. If anyone has a final question, please do post it now. Um, otherwise, we shall go over to our speakers. I think Amos is there. So Amos, I'm going to come to you after Justin. So we'll go Justin, Amos, Mohammed, Gabriel. Uh, please feel free to answer that question. The other question, because I know we've got people on the call from a range of civil society groups, international organizations, as well as uh, Kenyan civil society and Kenyan citizens. Uh, the other thing I'm going to ask you all to reflect on is perhaps if you had a magic wand to, uh, to design the budget, what would be the bit of social media research that you think needs to happen next to fill in the gaps in the kind of things that we've been talking about today? So two questions. As social media uh, continues to expand, will the hold of traditional media on electoral politics uh, be declined? And second, what would be, if you had a magic wand, the research project that you would most like to take on next? Okay, starting with you, Justin, and then after you, Amos. Okay, thanks. Um, fascinating questions. First of all, in terms of 
um, kind of what's going to happen with, with traditional media and social media. Um, I don't think that what we might call traditional media are going to vanish, going to vanish at all. I don't think that their influence will entirely fade away. Of course, the rise of these digital media does change the scope and nature of that. But as Gabrielle pointed out, one of the things that people are really quite adept in doing is looking across multiple forms of media to verify and check and think about information. So I don't think that radio and TV and newspapers are going to go away. It's much more they're going to be kind of drawn into a mix with these particular digital platforms. And of course, in some ways, newspapers are kind of sort of blurring into digital platforms themselves and quite significantly. So I don't think they're going to disappear. In terms of what research I'd like to see, well, um, I suspect other people will will kind of talk about you know, better filters and better AI. I'm the kind of person who is always interested in, in individual people. And so I would like to see more research on kind of what drives those bloggers. I'd like to see some nice qualitative research on what's going on for the bloggers and why they're doing it and how they take the decisions they take. That's the kind of thing that I'd, I'd be looking to, although I'm sure that could be matched with lots of very interesting kind of AI work that would improve our, our quantitative approach to this. Great, thanks. Amos, I'd love to hear a bit from you. You did a lot of great work as, as part of this project. Any reflections you have uh, on you know how you saw social media and of course just the, the role of social media in your own experience of the election so if you'd like please uh, reveal your video and unmute yourself and come in and after that we'll go to Mohammed. Amos are you there? Great Amos over to you and then we'll go to Mohammed next. Okay thank you for uh, those great presentations. Uh, it, uh, it is very informative uh, about uh, misinformation. So about the whole project and uh, the study, the, uh, I came to realize that misinformation is a complex thing to even track. And uh, when you come to realize uh, it later, you find that the beneficiaries of this in mis misinformation in most cases are not the ones who spread it uh, at large, you find that the proxies are the ones who spread it at large. So, for example, I was uh, two weeks ago, I was listening to Dennis Itumpi, who was uh, greatly involved in the, uh, the president's uh, uh, campaign. So he said uh, he has the way he manages it, it, it is very organized such that he, he uses around uh, 10 people per constituency uh, to spread just to trend a given uh, information. Uh, and uh, in the whole country, he has about 5,000 5, people who, are, who he pays to spread a given information. So you see, it is a, a very complex uh, thing when you find that if such a group decides to spread uh, a given information, you can't trace who is doing what or who is, uh, uh, is spreading what. So with the new trends, with the new research, I would like to see in this field that uh, is about uh, AI coming in to help us to exactly trace where this information is coming from, uh, who is spreading it, and the intentions. Though I, I know it is it will be very difficult uh, in this case, because spreading, uh, differentiating between the truth and misinformation is quite difficult. Yeah, that's what I have to say at the moment. Thanks so much, Amos. Great to have your input. Mohammed, over to you now. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, social media uh, continuing to expand, yes. Uh, social, the mainstream media themselves becoming social media channels is already happening. And whether they're going to lose their influence on electoral politics, I think uh, uh, as far as Kenya is concerned, we're a little bit far from that because as you notice, there are quite a number of people that are not on the online channels except WhatsApp. Uh, the rest uh, of social media, they, I mean, the rest of the people still get news from radio and local televisions and the issue of languages as well is coming up. There's quite a bit of vernacular radio stations, uh, vernacular TV stations that are coming up. So 
uh, it's going to be a while before mainstream uh, media loses its influence on the electoral politics. Then I also saw a question on uh, misinformation and gender perspective. Yes, uh, there were some attempts because in, in part of our classification is also gender violence. Uh, and we did see quite a number of attacks against uh, women candidates. Uh, we did pick up some of that. So to answer your question, yes or no, it's definitely a yes. And then uh, if I had a magic wand, like uh, what Nick says, uh, I think uh, where we need most uh, research uh, as far as uh, GDC is concerned is around the models AI, because as you note that the models are quite biased depending on who created them, where they were created, uh, they they are, they are attempts to make them less biased, but then again, uh, it requires quite a bit of research, and quite a bit of research should go into how much should the machine be able to do, uh, because I still believe that uh, there is the human aspect that is required in monitoring uh, such complex issues. So at what, where does the machine stop and the humans continue? So I think that requires quite a bit of uh, more research. So thank you, I'll stop there. Great, and finally over to you, Gabrielle, to wrap us up. Thanks. Um, in terms of whether one political party spread more misinformation than another, I mean, I think during the campaigns, it was pretty even, and actually what we saw was there wasn't a kind of mass coordination of misinformation at the party level for most of the campaigns because the parties aren't that organized and the alliances aren't that organized um, and actually a lot of the misinformation um, was associated with with individual candidates and their uh, campaign teams and social media teams rather than with kind of political party or alliance organized uh, campaign teams um, this changed i think uh, after the election, probably more misinformation by the losing side, but I don't think that's necessarily something inherent to Azamiro. Perhaps if Azamiro had been announced uh, the victors in the presidential race, we would have seen uh, more misinformation uh, by the Kenya Kwanzaa side. Um, in terms of the influential influence of traditional media, um, I think you know, the rise of social media has changed the nature of, of traditional media and what, how you do traditional media. You know, there's fewer um, newspapers being bought, for example, but an increasing number of people are reading newspapers online. Um, so it's increasingly important that traditional media use social media uh, to advertise uh, and to share information. So for example, some of the vernacular radio stations that are doing quite well are ones that are able to have quite significant online uh, presence and to uh, have recordings of popular shows available through social media, advertise panel events, for example, through social media. Um, so I think you know, traditional media will, will remain relevant, but those that can do social media better uh, will will probably uh, you know, forge ahead. Um, I think also those uh, traditional media outlets that gain or retain a reputation for being the place for more reliable information, you know, they'll continue to be a role for them because people do want, um, many people do want to, to fact check the information that they get from less reliable sources. In terms of the misinformation about women, Yes, I mean, this is a, a major problem. Um, I think one of the interesting things um, that was reported in the survey, and I don't know if Simon, you were here for that bit of my presentation, but um, political actors reported quite a significant decrease uh, in gender abuse uh, online as compared to 2017. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. <laughs> Definitely uh, was there and continued to be a problem and from various interviews with female candidates, this was something that they found really difficult to deal with. And especially for some of the lower level female candidates that I interviewed, for example, at the member of county assembly level, they, whilst they knew they had to engage in social media and they hired social media teams to do that work, they personally just found it too exhausting uh, to engage and just found the constant abuse thrown at them 
um, and the questions about their, you know, alleged affairs, et cetera, et cetera, just something that was just, took more mental energy than they felt that it was worth, uh, which as, as Justin said earlier, perhaps made them more, more vulnerable in the campaigns because it meant they, they couldn't necessarily respond to things in the same way if they were reliant um, on others to do that for them. In terms of questions that I'd like to see addressed, I mean, I like Justin, I'm primarily a qualitative researcher. Um, so I think uh, Justin's suggestion about kind of better understanding of who these, these bloggers are uh, and, and what their motivations are would be fascinating. I'd also like to see more on the, the impact of misinformation. So we know that there's a lot of misinformation out there. We know that people don't generally like it. We know that people call it out. But how, what is its actual impact? Um, is information that's known to be false, does it still have an impact? Because whilst people know, okay, they probably didn't say that, but it reminds me that it's the sort of thing that they might say. <laughs> and they are a bit arrogant and they are this. Um, so, you know, does misinformation have an impact even when people know uh, that it's false? Does it remind people of things and go, oh yeah, Ruto might not have said that at the rally, but it reminds me that Ruto you know, is alleged to have done these other things in the past. Um, so it's, yeah, I'd like to see more uh, on the impact of information, both that people don't know whether it's true or not, but also the impact of information that people uh, know is false and, and do uh, yeah, say to be safe. Fabulous. Thanks, Gabrielle, and thanks, everyone. Um, I think also your comments there and Justin's interesting comments earlier about the fact that some people who appear to be women online are, in fact, men, you know, suggest, again, the gender nature of social media. And I think that is, again, another area where further research will be really interesting. So thank you very much to everyone for joining us. This is clearly an area um, of great interest because we only started advertising this a couple of days ago. We had 90 people sign up and over 50 attend during the course of the session. So that's really fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much for really excellent questions today. It really added to the session. Um, for those interested, we've just had the Supreme Court deliver the full judgment on the election petitions. I just put a link into the chat where you can go to download that PDF. Uh, the very This is the very, very long one for those who, who aren't familiar, uh, the, the 155 page one, rather than the, the much shorter summary verdict, which they uh, gave already. Uh, so this has the full kind of reasoning for each of the points made in that summary verdict. So I'm sure many people will be pouring over this for years to come. Uh, but thanks everyone for joining. Just as I said at the beginning, we recorded this today. So we will be uh, using the recording and making it available publicly. And I'll send an email and tweets around uh, from the Democracy in Africa uh, Facebook and Twitter page. So we'll be sharing that and please do bring it to the attention of people who might have missed the advert given that this was relatively short notice. Thanks so much once again to our fantastic panelists for speaking and sharing their insights. And we look forward to seeing you at another event in the future. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone.